Hello, my friends. Welcome to another episode of the Gun Show podcast presented by MTD CNC. For those of you who have not listened to the Gun Show yet or even know what the Gun Show is about, guys, it's not about muscles. I don't have any of those. It's not about weapons. I don't have any of those either. And although we do make a lot of those in the manufacturing industry, I don't have them. What the Gun Show is about is literally my last name. And what we're trying to do is create awareness and reduce a massive skills gap in one of the most exciting industries in the world, which creates pretty much every damn thing around us. This is the Gun Show. So with that being said, today I have an amazing guest. He goes by the name Arthur. He is the director of live tools out of New South Wales, Australia. Arthur, thank you so much for sharing your time with uh, the Gun Show and with all of our listeners. Thanks, Tony. Thanks for having me on. It's absolutely my pleasure. So typically, we like to kick off this show with just a little bit about you. It could be your childhood or how you started your business or however, wherever you want to start in whenever year, whether it's diapers to college, totally up to you. But we want to get to know you. Okay. Well, look, uh, again, thanks for having me on, Tony. You know, we've known each other for over 10 years indirectly, you know, trade shows and it's uh, amazing to see how well you've done uh, with the gun show as well. So I'm, I'm proud of you, man. Flattery will get you everything. I, that's what I've heard anyway. So you let me know what you need when we hang up on this and uh, it's yours. Yeah. And for those of you who are listening, I did throw uh, author about 20, 20 bucks to say that. So, Man, well, you know, uh, the industry is awesome, you know, and, and how I got started in the industry, it's, it's quite funny because uh you know when i was doing uh metal working at school i think i i put a square piece of bar and a three three jaw chuck that's how bad i was <laughs> and uh the the way i got in the industry was uh i i went to do a motorcycle apprenticeship and i went to do some when i left school i went to uh do a course to to get my skills up in the, in mechanics and uh that course was was filled up. I couldn't get in. So uh, one of the guys from the, the college took me down to the uh, machining department. And uh, a teacher there said, well, why, why do you want to be a mechanic? You should, uh, you should invest in, in being a machinist. That way you can make stuff. And that's how I got in. That's how I got started. That's, and, that sounds fun. That, that, just off the well, get-go, you got offered some, some decent advice. Well, it was. Well, it was crazy is that, uh, you know, I never considered a, a, or even thought about a, a trade in, in manufacturing. But, you know, I had a really good trade teacher who showed me the ropes, uh, got me involved. And, and that's how I, I, I got my apprenticeship. He introduced me to a, a company in the local area. I, I grew up in a really country, country bumpkin kind of town. <laughs> and... Uh, the, the place where I did my apprenticeship, it was all uh, old school, let's say. You know, they had everything. They had a foundry. They had a conventional machine shop. They had fabrication. And it was really cool to see all the different layers of the industry. And, uh, you know, I, I, I did my apprenticeship there. And, you know, it was, when I say old school, it was, it was like I was filthy every day. I was I always burn marks on my chest with pieces of swarf. Going, going down my shirt, sometimes in my <laughs> ear. You know a piece of swarf was in your ear when it starts crackling in your, Ouch. In your shoe. So, yeah, that's, that, it, that, that beginning, it, that toughened me up. You know, like I, uh, I, I, let's say I, I was uh, a, a pretty soft kid, but after I uh, did my apprenticeship there, I was ready for anything, you know? <laughs> Maybe a little more deaf after having chips in your ear burning you up, but oh, <laughs> definitely <laughs> tougher as well. I have to ask your colleague, you're like, you know, shouting, get it out of my ear, get it out, you know, <laughs> but eventually it cools down, you can shake it out a little bit, you know, but anyway. I, I had a, somebody told me one time, they said, if you're going to be foolish, you got to be tough. <laughs> yeah, so I, 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 I didn't stay there that long, but, you know, I, uh, I, I toughed it out. There's a couple of times I wanted to leave, you know, like, why am I doing this? But at the end, you know, I, I, I really, I, I really enjoyed it, you know. I really liked working in a in a shop that had big machines, big conventional machines, taking big cuts. You know, when when I talk to other 
companies, they weren't doing that type of work. You know, they were doing small, small labor work, small milling work. So, you know, I, I felt really good at the end that I was, uh, I was working on big equipment, big uh, components. And, uh, and, and you went directly from burning your ears and your chest to owning live tools straight away, right? Like just a simple oh, story yeah. like, like everybody else. <laughs> nah. Nah, well, after, I, after I did the apprenticeship, I, I, uh, I, I moved away. There's a place here called the Gold Coast. I'm very aware of the Gold Coast, yes. Yeah, well, I, I wanted a break from, from my trade and, and I ended up going to the Gold Coast. I actually wanted to go and be a bartender for a little while. I couldn't find a job. I, I, it was really crazy. I, I you know, and uh, I, I, I bummed around for six months, you know, just uh, uh, enjoying myself. And uh, after I ran out of holiday money, I started <laughs> looking in the in the in the classifieds in the, the paper for a job. And it had a it had a job there that said uh, CNC machinist wanted uh, experience not necessary. So I'm like, okay, yeah, I'll do that, whatever. So I went from a place where I was uh, filthy every day, covered with grease, swore, and I went into this uh, place where uh, the interview, uh, it was this massive brand new building, and I walked in, had the interview, and he, the manager at the time said, you start on Monday. I'm like, I don't have my toolbox. I don't have all my gear here. They're like, oh, you don't need that. We've got it all for you. Oh, I like, couldn't believe it. You know, I walked from this old school, old school place. This was an aerospace factory. So I had no idea about this. You know, I was very naive about the other, other side of, of machining. So it went from this old school factory to this uh, nearly brand new, which actually at the time it was brand new uh, aerospace factory. And, you know, they had DMG, five axis machines. They had a lot of, three axis mills and they trained me from zero on on cncs and uh this place was called ferra engineering and you know there's a lot of international guys there they couldn't find a lot of machines here in australia so there's a lot of international guys as well as australians and it was fantastic i couldn't believe the uh the transition from from going to a dirty environment to uh, a lab coat shorts and, you know, I, I was blown away. So, you know, that, that apprenticeship had toughened me up. Uh, when I went into that place, it felt like a holiday. And it was a challenge uh, technically, but, you know, uh, it was, the conditions were amazing. So that got my, uh, that got my interest back into, into engineering again a lot. So I was there for a couple of years and uh, I started getting itchy feet again. I know that so, feeling. Yeah. Well, you know, where I worked in my apprenticeship, it was just basically you know, middle management and machinists. And, you know, in this, uh, this place, Ferra, there was programmers, there was estimators, there was, you know, foremen, there was sales representatives as well for the company. And I used to talk to one of the sales representatives all the time. And he said to me, you should apply for the job here as a sales representative. So, uh, I'm like, this, this sounds pretty good, right? So I went for an interview. They did a psychometric test on me. If you, if you don't know me, when I was 20, I'd probably look like I was more like I was 15, right? So, <laughs> you know, try, trying to be a sales representative in an aerospace company, and a guy that looks like he's a 15-year-old, probably wasn't a good look. So they said, yeah, you, you're doing pretty good, you know, technically, and you, you're well-spoken, but you look like a kid. <laughs> it's gonna take you seriously you know so they were pretty honest which was good because uh, I, I actually left there a few months later and and, uh, and moved to where I am now in uh, Newcastle New South Wales and I, I did a business course here and you know while I was doing a business course I was uh, I was working on the tools to pay pay the bills and uh, a sales representative from a car buy company come and spoke to me and the rest is history. I ended up being a sales rep for a, a, a carbide sales company selling uh, Mitsubishi Carbide. Would you like to go into a little detail about that in-between story? I know you've shared it with me before, and I oh. find it intriguing. And I'll tell you why I find it intriguing, author, and why I think it's worth sharing. is because we have a large audience 
that and a large global audience that um some of them are brand new to this industry and some have been doing it for a few years but really see the possibility that they could own their own shop or their own company or their own distribution company or whatever it might be and the authenticity of the story if you choose to share it and how you made that that segue from one to the other i believe personally is an inspirational story where Pierce, so, so a lot of people out there will connect with you and go, holy crap, are you kidding me right now? Is that, is that something someone can do? So if you want to share it, great. If not, we'll move on to the next part of the conversation. Sure, I'll share it. I'll share it with you. <laughs> so uh, look, the, the company that I work for, uh, they're called Metal Cutting Technology. They're a good company to work for. Uh, you know, they, they, they taught me a lot. There was a guy there that, an old guy. I hope one day he listens to this. He was called Joe Stokes. I hope he does. And, you know, to this day, you know, I hold a standard to uh, any sales rep to, to what he taught me, you know, and he was a, he wasn't a sales representative. He was a consultant. So he could walk into any other job and, and teach, you know, teach consultancy. So uh, working for him for, for 10 plus years taught me a lot. And, uh, you know, they, they had the usual suspects of, of tooling that most uh, distributed, distributors of carbide, you know, they had, they had uh, indexable tools, they made their own end mills, uh, you know, they had a machine accessories, but at that time, you know, uh, I suppose five axis, fifth axis uh, machining wasn't, wasn't that popular. So uh, as I'm, as I'm selling all this stuff, I've always been into buying and selling stuff on the side, you know, boats, cars, collectibles. So uh, while I'm working my day job, in the, in the weekends and the afternoons, I'd be selling stuff on eBay because I enjoyed it. You know, there'd be, where I lived, the neighbors hated me. We had about four boats out the front. There was always cars, complaining about there's no parks. I'm always doing up cars out the front of the uh, flat that I lived in. And, uh, you know, I, uh, I always love sourcing products and, and finding products to sell on eBay. Unfortunately, this, uh, this infected my day-to-day -day job. So, you know, I'd look through the catalog, a customer would ask me a question, do you guys have this? I'm like, of course we do. You know, I'm like, we need to source this right now. It got to the point where it, uh, another manager in the company got so pissed off with me uh, asking all the time to sell something different. He said, just set, you know, just calm your farm, just settle down, man. Just sell the things out of the catalog. Don't make my job hard. If you just do that, everything will be fine. And there was uh, one product that kept on flying on the radar that everyone kept on asking me. And uh, there wasn't much uh, competition in Australia at that time. And it was uh, live tooling for C-axis lathes. So uh, static and live tooling was always asked, do you guys sell, you know, BMT bolt on heads? Do you sell any VDI? And I'm like, yeah, I think I can do it, right? And I'm like, I had, a, I had lined up a company from, from Taiwan. They were always talking to me, they were really nice. You know, they always quoted me. And I always uh, tell, my, tell one of the managers there, hey, we can do this. I've got everything lined up. Just, just have to hit the go button. And we can sell this to the to the customers. And it got to the point, he got so pissed off when me asking so many times. He said, hey, if you think you can do it, go do it yourself. <laughs> At that point, <laughs> I didn't think twice of it. I, you know, I, I just said, okay, let, let's do it. So at that point, I actually bought the tools from overseas, took the risk on, sold it to the company I worked for, and then sold it to the end user. So essentially, this is how it started. Then after a few months, actually probably more than a few months, probably about a year, uh, some of the other sales representatives in the company started uh, making inquiries, started promoting the, the tooling. Uh, this is a, a brand out of, Evermore, uh, out of Taiwan called Evermore. And anyway, one of the guys there uh, won a massive package, huge package of, of uh live tooling and static tooling. So much so it caught the attention of uh, upper management of the company. And uh, that's when they said, hey, we want, we want now to, to take this on as a, as a brand. And by that stage, I saw the potential in it. And that's when I left. 
So and that was around 2013, 2012? 2012, 2013, roughly. Yeah. Yeah. So without a business plan, without a, a, an idea of anything, uh, yeah, I, I got up and left and started uh, Life Tools. I, I love the courage of that. And uh, everyone's story is a little bit courage. different. I don't know if it's courage. I think it might be stupidity. Oh, but you know, <laughs> yeah, and people say that all the time too. But to me, from my perspective, it's courage. You know, it's sure. Does it does stupidity come into play sometimes when we jump into the deep end of the pool? Yeah, and some people drown and some don't. You know, but but to me, it's courage, and and I like those types of stories. And I think that a lot of successful entrepreneurs, although the exact journey up a similar mountain is not ever the same it does take courage to do it. And I find value in that story. And I know people listening do as well when you go, yeah, you know, a couple of boats, a couple of cars, neighbors didn't like me flipping eBay. I'm, I'm waiting for you to go, you know, I'm, I'm going to sell uh, live tools for, you know, a few hundred million dollars. I'm going to go back to eBay. I'm going to go back to flipping some, some eBay <laughs> vehicles and boats but i have okay. to hold myself man i have to hold myself i love ebay i love flipping cars doing them up polishing them that's a hobby that's a hobby i yeah. have to hold myself day to day if if i didn't have live tools i'd be a hoarder so i'd, I'd see careful. i'd see you on that tv show wouldn't i on the show I'd, hoarders hey look uh, no doubt no doubt <laughs> So, all right. So, so you've made this journey. It's a great journey, you know, starting out doing your, your, <laughs> your uh, burning yourself with chips in your ears or chest. You decide, I don't want to do this anymore. I'm going to go, you know, serve some booze to people on the gold coast. And that was a somewhat of a struggle. Cause it seems like everybody wants to do that. You came back and did some technical sales for over a decade and learned a lot. And then, you know, switched over through a segue of eBay to starting your own company, which we now know as live tools, right? Yeah. Mm. And, and live tools, you know, I've known, like you said, at the beginning of this, we've known each other for nearly a decade at this point. And, and, and I've known you for many reasons. I've known you to be a good guy for many reasons, but you also carry just such a great variety of products that you're really able to support the majority, if, if, if not all of the Australian market, and even if you decided to branch out into New Zealand, like I know we've talked about before, some other places, but we were talking about, you know, Hank uh coolant that you and I have spoken about a lot, really great company. You know, I see PH Horn on here. You know, I see um, Yes Tool. I see Elliot. Everyone knows Elliot. My buddies over at Monaghan Tooling Group also support Elliot. I'm Dayton, Ohio. I've known you from air turbine spindles where, you know, I worked for a decade. We first met, man. Uh, that's right. You got Alberti on here. You got Ferion on here. You got Fifth Axis, who, you know, we're familiar with together as well. Um, I mean, you really just have a smorgasbord of high quality products, which to me shows your character and the high quality company and people that you, you, you are and the people that you hire are. So, Let's talk a little bit about live tools and, and what you guys do in the area you support and the future of where you see yourself going. Well, you know, with that variety of products, right? When I first started, like the transitioning from eBay to this, right? One thing about selling, one thing about selling things on uh, eBay and collectibles is that you have a product that is unique. So the buyer, the buyer is always like, that's a unique product. And I, I really want that. Now, Transit, which is this is going to be a funny transition to, to talk about, but <laughs> in Australia at, at you know 10 years ago, uh, anyone who's in cutting tool market or machine tool accessory market, all they care about was the, the top 80% of products. They only cared about what was the high volume, high selling products. And that's where I slotted in. So I look, without a business plan, but I did have a bit of an idea that the special tools market, all the niche products, we wasn't looked after in this country because they weren't high turnover. So, you know, uh, an individual, and I say just myself in the company at that time, I could support uh, business just by selling uh, niche products. So I, when I left the company, I went into uh, Emo in uh, Hanover, Germany. And this is where I first met you. 
I was just about to say what year was that because I think that was when we first met. Yeah, yeah, that blew me away. That show that was that was amazing. That, that, I got a I've got a trade show addiction traveling the world now. <laughs> I don't even source products. I just want to go to the machinist nightclub and just say hello to everybody. But I I was blown away and all the things that I'd never seen before. All these brands that weren't in Australia and I wondered why are these here. Well, you know, sustainable sustainability for a company to support only niche products is you can't do it. But for an individual, I could. So I, I collected as many brochures I could fit on a backpack. You know, at that time, I you know uh, would have been like late twenties, early thirties. I still look like I was fifteen. So you know, <laughs> these guys are trying to take me seriously. You know, I, you know, every time I go and speak to someone, I'm like, we. I'd always say we, and they go, who else is there? I'm like, mm, it's just me. But you know, I, I kind of, I, I kind of fudged it a little bit. You know, I, I needed to get uh, people on board. So you know, I worked really hard to to get these names and some of these uh, brands out that in in Australia that I was uh, promoting. So you know, uh, that's how it concept started. As we started to grow the team, as we started getting more people, you know, and and uh, the system started maturing. We we needed other products. We needed uh, not only the niche products, but we needed more of the uh, consumer products. So still with the same ethos, still the same motives. Like what's different? What's what's different about this cutting tool? What's different about this machine accessory? Because you know we didn't want to be the same company selling the same crap with every everyone else. You know. So uh, a lot of the brands you see on our website, a lot of the brands you see that we promote, these are, these are brands that weren't, weren't either represented in Australia or weren't well represented in Australia. So that's, that's the mission of Live Tools is that we're bringing things here that, that are not well representative, that have huge potential, that can save time, uh, can cut machining costs. And, and this, to this day, we still do the same thing. So. Uh, as, as we're getting, you know, uh, more and more reputation in the market after so many years, uh, now we, we have other companies approach us, uh, which is an absolute honor. Like before, we were, we were beggars. We were trying to convince uh, overseas suppliers that we were worth our salt. But then now we have some, some guys coming in approaching us, hey, we'd like you to represent this brand. And I, I'm blown away by this. I'm absolutely honored. Well, it's what hard work and well deserved. You know, you, as you said, that emo 2000 had to be what 14, maybe, probably maybe, around yeah. 2014, around that time. I mean, I, it blew me away too. That was my first emo, um, and I was with one company, and you were, you know, scouting a bunch of companies to bring to Australia. But I think you hit the nail on the head when you said uh, you, you can only do but so much with products that have already been saturated you know you're just you're at that point what are you doing competing on price competing on service which service is important of course and and quality is important of course but there's very little margin to make a company in my opinion overall better if we're limited to what we're supplying them so someone like yourself comes along and offers alternatives and yeah some are niche and some are not they're just new but the fact that you've been able to bring that type of technology to Australia, I think is important to recognize. There's, look, there's some brands that we uh, started promoting 10 years ago that are only just starting to come online now. So, you know, when I went to uh, Emo, I seen all these vices, self-centering vices with these little teeth in them. I'm like, what the hell do you use them for? <laughs> what, would, what, what would you use that for? And, you know, it was the, it was a, that technology was around 10 years ago. And uh, I, I always had brochures and always saw the websites. And I'm like, I still don't see a use for this equipment here. And only in the last five years that, you know, we've had the, the, the fifth, fifth axis explosion of, of machine tools. And as software has become more accessible as far as the cost of software, you know, some of the... Um, higher end softwares were out of reach of uh, you know small small machine shops so now these products are starting to come online they're starting to explode and they were they were introduced to the market you know a long time ago but we never had uh, the market for it so yeah look uh, the, some of the products are pretty strange 
um, you know, we've got we've got some products that we sell once a year. We've got some products we sell every day. But you know, uh, we on my last count, we had over 150 vendors from around the world. We're like the United Nations of the tooling world. You know, it's crazy. So, that is uh, incredible. Yeah, yeah, it's it's sometimes hard to manage. Uh, we're very lucky that we invested into uh, our systems very early on, which was uh, painful for me when I was when we were very small. But now that we're we're getting bigger, it's it's been a good investment. So I have a question for you, and this is something I wonder a lot. And you can lie to me if you wish, or be perfectly honest if you wish. Oh, because... no, lie for sure. <laughs> <laughs> because you know this this is being recorded, so we can edit whatever we want. Um, you have a lot of products, right? And there's a concern oftentimes, and I hear it here in the US, but you know that I've traveled the world a lot, so it's not just a US thing. Um, I've heard a lot of times that representatives and or distributors carry on more products than they have the technical, technical ability to explain and help their customer understand. Mm -hmm. I would say knowing you and live tools for so many years, you guys do a fairly good job of making sure that you understand how the products work because you're kind of on an island in the middle of Oceana and you don't get to just travel to headquarters all the time to do hands-on studying, but you make sure that you understand. So to summarize my question, I think that there's a lot of people feel like whether it's the end user or the manufacturer, the gap in between the information that the manufacturer knows and the information that the end user receives through some form of distribution or representation oftentimes gets lost in the wash based on the understanding of the product itself. How do you feel about that, knowing how many excellent products you carry? You know, uh, this goes back to the days of, uh, of the manager that taught me. I told you he was a consultant, right? So the consultative process is about asking questions. I, I'm going to be honest. There's no way in hell we're going to be technical, uh, technical on every single product. But there's one thing that holds true on every single product. There's a, there's a set of questions you need to ask your your end user, your client. So understanding about what their issue is, understanding what their their problem is, what they want to achieve out of it. So what what the what does the end look like for the for the client? So maybe you the set of questions we ask, right? What, what's the most important thing? Is it delivery? Is it is it a price? You don't care what it performs like. You just want something cheap to throw in your machine, right? Or, or is it performance? You, you're trying to knock down cycle time. You want to, you want to look at a cost uh, analysis. So how much is a tool versus how many components? So just understanding that question to start with will cut, cut half the products that you want to offer to a client. Second part is once you find out what, what he wants, you can do the research in the background. We have a we have a saying here in our company, and this is this is company policy. It's in in everyone's position description. It's in uh, it's in the ethos. It's called LMFO, and it's okay. called Let Me Find Out. So, <laughs> you know, no one here is allowed to say something they don't know. It's just company policy. There's uh, you know, uh, if if I if we ever catch any of the sales guys saying saying lies to our clients, you know, that's it, man. So, you know, if, if a client's not patient with us, it's probably not going to be good to work with. But if, if, if our customers are patient, and all of them are, they're really good, uh, we just say LMFO, we'll get back to you. We do the research in the background. We understand each product. Is it like, like I said, there's 150 vendors. It's, it's, in, it's impossible to understand this to the point of, uh, of expertise level. I mean, I've been around for a long time with the, with the, with the business. So, you know, the top... The top 80% of products I know well, and I train the guys. But when they get caught, the company's motto is, we'll get back to you. We'll do the research. We'll find out how this works. So, example, I'm training a new guy right now. Uh, and uh, as we go through the products and the product categories, we have something in our company to train the guys. It's called the cheat sheet. So these guys will get a set of questions to ask the customer, in a sense, as they go through the cheat sheet, they're learning about the product through questions. And you know, all the guys we have are either engineers or machinists. We don't have any other type of sales representative here. So they already have mechanical aptitude to understand 
how things go together, how, how to machine. So, you know, coupled with their own experience, plus asking the right questions with the cheat sheet. So the cheat sheet's got kind of a, you know, when we look at coolant, we're asking what's the problem with your coolant? You know, uh, what make a model of the current coolant you have? Does it foam? Does it go off? They ask all those questions. By the time they've asked all those questions, the answer's already, and it's already clear and apparent to them. So that's a very long answer for such a short question. That's how we get around the technical uh, part of our company is, we don't expect everyone to be an expert, but we'll find out. It's a very wise answer, <laughs> regardless, regardless of the length. It was a very wise answer. And I think it was one that um, helps answer the question fully to people who sit in limbo on, you know, that, that consumer side of things and on the manufacturing side of things. So I think that's very fair. Um, you mentioned what, 150 products, 80%, you know, very well, 20%, you're doing your best and you probably will, you know, off like the back of your hand before too much longer um but very very fair and and saying and that's something i always did as well author i, I may have may have learned that from you who knows i, I definitely value your wisdom but that was something that i <laughs> but that was always something i'd always done as well i was like look man i don't know everything i'm not gonna know everything it's i mean i play that right now i surround myself with some of the most brilliant people on the planet working with MTD and I'm interviewing them on something that they've been doing for 20, 30 years. And I have to instantly not be a dummy on camera when I'm asking these questions. Right. So I find that to be somewhat difficult and I admire um, the, the projects that you've taken on and the value that you bring to the Australian market. So live tools themselves, do you support the whole of Australia and what is the growth that you hope to have um, moving forward? Yeah, we, we do question, answer your question. Yeah, we do support the whole of Australia. We have a few sales reps that are external to us. <coughs> Besides, uh, which is really strange, our growth came from internal uh, sales, not from external. So pre-COVID, through not having so, so many sales reps, we already were working remotely. So using Teams meetings, Zoom meetings to contact clients, even WhatsApp. So we'd, we'd ask customers to download WhatsApp so we could see their machining issues. So when COVID hit, we were set. We already had everything in place because that's the way we did business. So moving forward, uh, our goal for uh, the next couple of years is to have a sales representative of every state of our, of our country. Right now, we're looking at having two, two sales reps in certain areas with the growth. Uh, taking on uh, the New Zealand market, we already sell to New Zealand. Uh, we're exporting coolant, believe it or not, to one end user in uh, New Zealand, which is great. Uh, and yeah, eventually, the way, the way we'd like to do is, is uh, maybe look at the uh, other, other countries. But for now, we want to we feather our own nest here in Australia. So uh yeah putting on more salespeople and more internal structure here to, to grow the business i like that and uh you let me know when you expand over to the uh, balinese market and if you need a, a sales representative in bali you let you let me know all right i might be able to, to tag team two jobs i hear they got some sweet ass manual machine shops with guys <laughs> not wearing any glasses or any shoes you can, you can get in there man <laughs> sell some high speed steel maybe but the, Indian we'll figure, market, the Indonesian market's incredible, huh? Well, Jakarta seems to be doing all right. I'm not sure how much manufacturing is in Bali, but the Indonesian market is in the top 15 in the world, and they're doing great. And that part well, I agree well, with. When we, when we decide to open up that branch of live tools, I'll come over six months worth of training with my shorts. <laughs> That'd be great. Yeah, that sounds well. If you're living here in Florida, you can come visit me anytime in your shorts as well. It's always summer. Yeah, so, man. Author, as you know, and as we've discussed, when I start to close out this show, I really like to offer our audience a piece of wisdom um, from each of our guests. And, and you coming from your background, um, having great stories, being the owner of a company, um, continually growing and having success. Uh, and you can choose who you'd like to address your advice to. And and uh, you and I have discussed this previously, but for those who are listening for the first time, 
I always give our, our guests the option of um, offering advice for someone who's maybe looking to get into the industry, kind of riding that fence, um, someone who's in the industry and looking to either grow within it or launch their own project, or someone who's been in the industry so long that just has kind of burnt out and, and is stagnant and needs some motivation. So I let I let our guests, in this case, author, choose who he'd like to direct his message to. But author, uh, what piece of advice would you like to, to offer our listeners today? For, look, for anyone who's starting a business, and this is going to sound so cliche, but I'll give the reason. Make sure you enjoy what you do when you don't even make money off it, when it's not going well. You want to happen, you want to make sure that you still enjoy it, that you still can push through the, the pain of when it's not going well or you made the wrong decision. So, you know, if, uh, if you pick something, you're just looking to make money and when it gets hard and uh, you're, not gonna, you're not gonna have the stamina to push through to the next, next stage to see it through. So make sure you pick something that you enjoy, whatever it may be. Yeah, I uh, 1 million percent agree with that. And you started that by saying, you know, we've kind of heard it before. It's kind of cliche. But if we could kind of stamp that on everyone's forehead and make sure that it's legit, there'd be a lot more happier people uh, doing the jobs that they're doing. Right. Look, you know, people do a business plan. They're looking at their business plan from perspective of um <clears throat> looking for business plan perspective of monetary that should be the first thing should be on the top of the business plan am i going to enjoy this when it goes down because you need to push through the pain threshold when it's uh not going well and you need to learn as quickly as possible through that and uh if, if you know that you're going to enjoy it you enjoy the same you know what you're what you're doing you are going to push through you're going to you're going to get to the next level agreed and author Thank you so much for being a friend. Congratulations on your, your success. Uh, myself and MTD wish you continued growth and success. And if there's anything we can do for you, you let us know. Obviously, we are going to do our very best to come see you uh, at the next exhibition. Uh, but thank you for sharing your story with our audience author. And thank you for being a friend. We do appreciate that. Um, for those of you who are listening, guys, gals, everyone, let's look at our engineers and be equally as proud of the person who's building that airplane as the one that's flying it. The one who's helping build those medical parts as the ones who are using them. The ones who are help making, helping to make our cars, our phones, our computers, pretty much every daggone thing around us. And author, Live Tools, you are amazing. Thank you for being on The Gun Show. Thanks, Tony. Proud of you, man. And that's so good to speak to you again. Always a pleasure, brother.